Welcome in to the newest edition of the Checkerboard Chat. I'm your host, Ryan Shumpert, the sports editor here at the UT Daily Beacon, and it has been a hectic, tumultuous day on Rocky Top as Tennessee has made the move away from head coach Jeremy Pruitt due to the internal investigation into the football program and recruiting violations. And with leaving with him is going to be Tennessee Director of Athletics, Philip Fulmer, who resigned his post today. And we'll dive right into it as we'll look at Fulmer's firing, or excuse me, Pruitt's firing, Fulmer stepping down, the timetable of how they find a replacement and who potentially could be that replacement. And it was a long, you know, Tennessee was kind of in, was kind of circling the airport for a long time, trying to make a decision on what they wanted to do for their head football coach, whether they're going to keep Pruitt or not. And a lot of that was tied to the investigation. And they finally made the decision today to move on. I don't think the decision was necessarily shocking to anybody, but after a month of who knows what's going to happen, it, it did feel surprising for something to finally come and to have an outcome. Now, a little bit more on the investigation. We were able to get a few more details on that today as Chancellor Dondi Plowman, UT President Randy Boyd and Fulmer met with the media and Plowman said that that investigation began back on November 13th when someone leaked potential recruiting violations and problems in Tennessee's football department to the university. Now Plowman did not elaborate on who that was, whether that was someone inside the program or outside the program. But we did see that they were first made aware of it on November 13th with investigation beginning soon after that. We didn't know about this investigation until December 19th when Trey Wallace broke the news that Tennessee was investigating their football program. So that gives a little bit more timetable to why it was taking Tennessee so long. It does seem to be more legitimacy, I guess, linked to the violations than maybe previously thought of. I think before it was previously thought of that this was something they were doing to just fire Jeremy Pruitt with cause, which we'll get to in a minute. They are at least attempting to do. Now we'll see if they have to pay Jeremy Pruitt any of his buyout. But I think it's it's easy to say now that there were serious and violations going on. Donnie Plowman said level one and level two violations occurred now, if Jeremy Pruitt had gone seven and Tennessee had gone seven and three, six and four this year, would it have these violations been enough to get him fired? I don't know, probably not. But he went three and seven, 16 and 19 in his three years, combined that with recruiting problems, NCAA problems too, and it was enough to get Jeremy Pruitt out. Now, Philip Fulmer, he, he said that his decision to step down was related to the belief that the new coach and new athletic director needed to be on the same page, needed to have the same vision and same goals. And that he felt it would be unfair to the new coach for him to hire him, knowing that he would not be there, be there for the entirety of his tenure at Tennessee. It makes sense in a lot of ways. In some ways you wonder if this was truly a decision that Fulmer was able to make himself or if he was pushed in that direction as either way, the man who came back to become Tennessee's director of athletics with the goal of fixing the Tennessee football program, the program that has failed to get back to the levels it was when he was its head coach from 1992 to 2008, he failed in that mission. And certainly a, a tough day for a man who's given so much of his life to the University of Tennessee, a university that he loves so much. But what I feel like was probably the most pressing or most notable thing from the press conference today was Donnie Plowman's decision or in informing the media that they will hire a new athletic director before they hire a new football coach. So you have Tennessee looking to make a, make a move at head football coach very late. We're already past the early signing period by over a month. We are under three weeks away from the signing date. Tennessee starts classes on Wednesday. They had their early enrollees all get here this weekend. Will they, you know, will those guys decide to start class on Wednesday? Will they look around at their options? I think a lot of that is unclear. Plowman and Fulmer were, were set to address the team this afternoon, this evening. Caden Salter, quarterback signee, has said on Twitter that he plans on staying no, no matter what. So that provides a little bit of clarity, but there's still a lot of, a lot of unclarity about the future of Tennessee's program. And without a head coach right now in middle of January and 
they're not hiring one first, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what they do when they can hire a coach. Now, typically spring practice starts at Tennessee in the middle of the March. They could potentially push that back. But I think that's a, a decent timetable of where you're looking to see that Tennessee needs to make a head football coaching hire by. If they don't do that, I think you could see Kevin Steele, who was, was named the active coach today, interim head coach. I think you could see him. If they don't hire anybody by start of spring practice, I think you could see Steele potentially be the coach all of the 2021 season and then Tennessee to move on from there. Now, I don't think that's the best idea. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit of reason why. I think to people, people look back at this situation to where you can kind of compare it to when Lane Kiffin left three weeks before National Signing Day. And I think those are fair comparisons. At least I see why, why people were making the comparisons. And at that time, Tennessee made a, a bad hire and decided to go with Derek Dooley instead of potentially hiring full, former Tennessee offensive coordinator and former assistant David Cutcliffe or just hiring an interim coach for a year and then kind of resetting things. While I, I think that may have been a smart thing back in 2010, I guess it would have been when Kiffin left. I don't think it is now for a number of reasons. Starting with I, the landscape of college football is so much different now. We have the one-time free transfer rule that's going to occur or going to be passed by the NCAA, allowing all players to, like it says, transfer one time with no penalty. They don't need a waiver from the NCAA. I think if you don't hire a coach full-time, I think you're going to see a lot of young, talented players on this Tennessee roster leave. And now, while it's certainly going to be a work in progress for the new head coach, this roster is much better now than what Jeremy Pruitt inherited, potentially because of some of the recruiting instances that got him in trouble. But without a clear voice and future of the program, I think you'll see a lot of those young players leave. You already saw Wanya Morris transfer to Oklahoma. Henry Toto had decided to come back to Tennessee, but was considering transferring. I think a lot of that's on, on the table. I think that's one thing that makes it not the best decision. And then the other one that's big is you look at this coming up recruiting class and, and the talent that's in the state of Tennessee, looking at the 247 composite rankings, you have 12 four-star recruits, upwards of probably 16 guys that Tennessee will be recruiting from the in-state, and that includes both the number two player in the country and Walter Nolan, who's at St. Benedict High School in Cordova, Tennessee, playing for former Vol Marlon Walls. And then you have a top 50 recruit in Quarterback Ty Simpson, who's the highest rated quarterback in the state of Tennessee since rankings have been a thing. So you have a, you have something there that could help the new coach immediately build. You have you get a new coach in, he has the vision, he's selling the future to recruits. And you have a, a big group of good players in the state of Tennessee that, you know, that not every single player wants to stay stay and play for their home state, but it's certainly a lot easier to attract top level talent from your own state than other states when for a lot of these kids, the other options are go play for Georgia, Clemson, Alabama teams that are competing for national championships and SEC championships on a yearly basis. So I think that would be a bad move for Tennessee. Now, I don't, nothing that Plowman said today indicated that, that would be the plan, but they only took probably five to 10 minutes worth of questions. So no one was able to ask that. And there hasn't been a whole lot of hirings done, whether it's been an offensive coordinator, a head football coach, chancellor, or athletic director that have gone particularly quick on this campus. Now, I imagine that Randy Boyd and Plowman will have a major sense of urgency to get this athletic director hired done so they can move on and get a head football coach. But I think that is certainly something that's going to be worth watching in the coming months. We'll move now to the hot board and see Look at some candidates that Tennessee could potentially move to. We have a hot board up, our hot board 1.0 on utdailybeacon.com right now. Check under the sports or the football heading. Who all do we have on that? Some of this is hard to tell. Tennessee doesn't have an athletic director yet. If Philip Fulmer was the athletic director, the list would certainly look different than what we put out today. If we knew who the athletic director was and who he had ties to, he or she had ties to, that would make putting a hot board to, together easier as well. But without that being said, we included on there Hugh Freeze, Jamie Chadwell, Billy Napier, Gus Malazan, Tom Allen, Bill O'Brien, 
Lane Kiffin, and Gerard Mayo. Now I think a guy like Freeze, who's been a popular hope, I guess, for Tennessee fans. He had a lot of success at Ole Miss, made it to two New Year's Six Bowls, beat number one and number two Alabama back-to-back seasons. I don't think you're going to see that just because of his baggage. He was had a lot of recruiting violations when he was at Ole Miss that he was being investigated for, for and obviously had an extramarital affair on recruiting visits, and that is what ended up getting him fired. But you talk about today the message, the key message from from Randy Boyd and Chancellor Plowman was that you're going to do things the right way at Tennessee, that you – they aren't going to cheat. They don't want to do that. Now, that's a, a rare thing, I think, in college football. But that's the message that, in the direction that they want to go. They clearly do not want to go after another risky candidate who could get them in trouble with the NCAA. And that's a, that's right down Hugh Freeze's ballpark. So I don't think you'll see that. Jamie Chadwell is a guy that's from East Tennessee. I think he'd be very, very open and excited to take this job questions for him he is you know he's only spent two years as an FBS head coach and he has done just a fantastic job of moving Coastal Carolina up or helping Coastal Carolina adjust to life in the FBS as they moved from the FCS to FBS just about five years ago but he doesn't have any major big school experience not a whole lot as an assistant either but a track record that really speaks for itself both as an FCS head coach at Charleston Southern and a couple other schools. And then you add that on to what he's done at Coastal Carolina, two-time FCS coach of the year, a guy that would would definitely be intriguing as a, he's an offensive minded coach, something that, you know, it's hard to say what the new athletic director will be looking for, but the way college football is moving to a high paced offense and with Jeremy Pruitt being a defensive coach, I think it's, it's uh, easy to speculate that that could be the potential direction they look at. Billy Napier, another up-and-coming coach, kind of a lot of similar things to to Chadwell. A Cookville, Tennessee native, Napier has done a great job as a Louisiana head coach for three seasons where he's made it to the Sun Belt Championship game all three years, had an impressive 10-1 record this season where they upset Iowa State who made it to the Big 12 Championship. This one feels a little bit more unrealistic than the previous two and maybe some other ones on this list. So those, some of them on this list are pretty unrealistic, but Napier has, he hasn't been, he hasn't been eager to leave Louisiana. He was offered South Carolina job this year. He was offered Auburn job this year. He's been tied to a lot of big jobs and he hasn't, hasn't bolted for any of them. So given the instability around the Tennessee job, given the odd timing around the fact that Tennessee is hiring a coach, I'm not sure that Napier would be, Particularly interested, but that's a guy I think Tennessee will reach out on. Reach out to, excuse me. And Gus Malazan is the next option we have on there. He's a, obviously the name kind of speaks for itself. Eight years as Auburn head coach, made it to a national championship game, but was kind of stunted by his inability to beat Georgia and LSU. He really did a great job beating the dynasty that has been Nick Saban in Alabama, got three wins in eight years, but could only get three against LSU and two against Georgia. Um, those are two programs that, while it's hard to judge yourself against Alabama as good as they've been, I know Auburn knows that they can be just as good, if not better, than LSU and Georgia. Malazan's a guy you think would be eager to jump back in the league. He Auburn wasn't particularly bad this season. They weren't particularly bad last season. It was just kind of the long-term insta- – not instability, long-term – averageness and or above averageness and inability to really get back to championship levels that got him fired. The thing that stands in the way of this seeming like a realistic option is the Kevin Still aspect. Tennessee's new acting head coach was the defense coordinator at Auburn last year under Malazan and his involvement in what was essentially a coup to make him the head coach isn't particularly clear, but there were some big name boosters who helped pay Malazan's buyout, they helped get rid of him. And they wanted Kevin Still in there to be the new head coach. So I think that makes the relationship between those two very strange. Now, will whoever Tennessee hires have to keep Kevin Still on staff? That's another thing that's going to be worth watching. But I think it makes the awkward relationship between those two, I think, would make Malazan an unlikely candidate at Tennessee. 
Another guy on the hot board, we have Tom Allen, head coach at Indiana, guy that got Indiana to the Gator Bowl in 2019 when they played Tennessee, had a big lead and kind of blew it. But he had gotten Indiana back to a New Year's, or excuse me, to a, a New Year's Day a Florida Bowl game, and that was a huge achievement. And I mean, Tennessee won that game last year, and from that moment on, Tennessee's program has gone straight downhill, and Indiana's has taken a fast track up as the Hoosiers had an impressive 6-1 and one regular season this year with their lone loss coming to Ohio State as they were able to pick up wins over Michigan and Penn State. What would Allen's interest be like in Tennessee? That's a little unclear. Like, like everybody, like we were saying with Napier, the surrounding situations doesn't make this particularly desirable, um, getting hired in what could be February or March. And then the last three names we had on the list, guys that are a little more long shots or maybe a little less likely. Bill O'Brien has been a bit of a uh, laughing stock of the football fan world. I don't know about the, the football coaching world. I don't think that's true for how he handled things in Houston, trading DeAndre Hawkins and a lot of good pieces on a, the Houston Texans roster. He was fired this year, but what makes him an, an intriguing idea for Tennessee is just the fact that he has experience in a role like this where things are insta- unstable. He was the head coach to follow Joe Paterno at Penn State when they had that awful scandal and the sanctions that came from the NCAA after that. And O'Brien did just an excellent job of guiding Penn State through that and huge scholarship losses. And really he kept Penn, State, Penn State's program in a good place to, to where he, when he left for Houston, they got a great head coach in James Franklin and they've really been able to to rebound from, from the scandal that, and the sanctions that followed Paterno's uh, leaving Penn State. Obviously, the way things went for him in Houston, he's not quite as desirable now. There had been some things that linked him to Alabama's offense coordinator job. It'll be interesting to see that. Moving on, Lane Kiffin, obviously a guy that uh, I don't think anyone listening to this needs a whole lot to know about. I don't think this is very, very likely, but I, I do think you could see Kiffin try to float his name out there through his agent. Um, whether that being the fact that he has interest in returning to Tennessee or that being he's just trying to stir up drama. And we know Kiffin likes to do that, stir up drama and potentially get himself a raise at Ole Miss where he will be entering his second year as head coach next fall. And then the last name on the list is, is a guy with less coaching experience, but that's Gerard Mayo, former Tennessee linebacker. Mayo is really a, a up and coming coach, though he doesn't have as much experience. I know he he was linked to potentially interviewing for some NFL head coaching jobs um, this time around. So he's another guy I think is probably a little bit more of a long shot. I don't think he'll be Tennessee's first choice, but I think it's certainly someone that's worth worth uh, interviewing and taking a hard look at if he's a guy that's good enough to be on Bill Belichick's staff and. He's a young guy, and if he has the energy to turn around this program, I think he would certainly be an interesting guy to at least consider. Before we go out, one, one more thing that I failed to talk about at the, at the forefront of this podcast when talking about Pruitt being firing, fired is the fact that Tennessee was able to fire him with buyout, or excuse me, with cause, so they do not have to pay his buyout. Now, that would potentially help Tennessee – spend more money on a new coach. Now, how much money do they have to spend? That's hard to say. Not paying the buyout would help, but obviously revenues across college sports down massively this fall due to COVID-19. But Tennessee pointed out, I have the Pruitt's termination here, a copy of Pruitt's termination here. They pointed to two reasons in his initial contract to, to being able to fire him with cause. Um, part A was that conduct or omission by coach that constitutes a level one or level two violation of one or more govern- governing athletic rules. The second, pretty similar, conduct or omission by a person who reports directly or indirectly to coach that constitutes a level one or level two violation of one or more governing athletic rules. So you saw that term level one, level two violations in the NCAA. I think that's probably a good reason why Chancellor Plowman was throwing that out there today to kind of back up the fact that they were firing coaches with cause. Will Tennessee be able to do that? Jeremy Pruitt has until Wednesday to 
contest his firing, contest his firing cause. And I would expect that he would do that and that him and his agent and Jim Sexton would be trying to work out a negotiation buyout with Tennessee. And that's, that's what I anticipate will happen. Not that Tennessee will pay the full buyout, I believe, which it would be about $12 million to prove it, but that they would pay, reach a settlement with him. Now, Pruitt also was not the only head, only coach Tennessee to be fired today. About nine total people involved around the Tennessee football program were let go. That includes assistant coaches, Shelton Felton and Brian Niedemeyer, who were also caused, fired with cause. The reasons there included the first one that I read to you a minute ago, and then also a failure of coach to report promptly to the director of athletics or the staff member in the athletic department with primary responsibility for compliance and any actual knowledge of or reasonable cause to believe that a violation of govern governing athletic rules or university rules has been committed by a coach and or any other person. And then one last one that was included, conduct or omission by coach that constitutes material neglect or inattention by coach to the standard or duties generally expected of university employees and specifically required of coach under this agreement. So we see Tennessee firing coaches with cause. That's going to be their plan going forward. Those were also not the only people involved in Tennessee's football program to get fired today. In off the field coaching roles who don't have contracts. So we were not given those termination letters, but the director and assistant director of football player personnel, a football quality control coach and four members from the on-campus recruiting staff were also let go today. Tennessee will now look to move forward, trying to find its newest athletic director, and then after that, its newest head football coach. We will keep you fully updated with everything at the UT Daily Beacon, and we're not sure how much we'll have of football coverage on stuff as the Tennessee looks to, as we said, hire an athletic director first. But everything you need to know, we have for you, utdailybeacon.com. And we will be back next week talking more about the football search, the athletic director search, while also diving into a big week of basketball for the Tennessee men's basketball team who travels to Gainesville to take on Florida Tuesday night and will return home to Thompson Bowling Arena Saturday night to face top 25 Missouri team. Where And we'll also have full coverage of the Tennessee Lady Vols for you next week as they have a historic matchup against arch rival UConn this week. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your week.